It's been a long, painfully grueling process lasting all the way through the summer until now, but the James Harden saga finally has a conclusion. From the very beginning of it all, the Los Angeles Clippers were a team Harden preferred to go to, and after a lengthy delay, he got his way and is now the newest member of the Clippers. Obviously, that's what we're here to talk about in today's video, and trust me, there is a lot to go over. Specifically, we'll be going through the full trade details, the implications for both teams involved, the pros and the cons for each side of the trade, and then some discussion about what I believe could be the secret plan that the Sixers are cooking up as a result of all of this. Before we start though, it turns out a good amount of you watching right now aren't even subscribed to the channel, so if you enjoy the content, consider hitting the subscribe button, as not only does it help out a ton, but it also very much appreciate it. Now with that being said, let's begin. Before we get into everything, we of course have to start with what exactly the details of this trade were. In the deal, the Los Angeles Clippers received James Harden, PJ Tucker, and Philip Petrushev, and in return, the Philadelphia 76ers received Robert Covington, Nicholas Batum, KJ Martin, Marcus Morris, two first round picks, two second round picks, and a first round pick swap. There's a lot going on for both sides here, so to start things off, I'll be going over the implications of the deal for the Clippers, and then I'll switch over to the 76ers side of things in the second half of the video. The Clippers have been trying to put together a championship contender for five years now, as the summer of 2019 marked the time when they officially went all in on contention and brought both Kawhi Leonard and Paul George to town. From the very beginning of that partnership, the Clippers have been not only a group led by legitimate top tier star talent, but they've also had one of the deepest rotations year in and year out with productive role players across the board around them. Every year for the past four seasons, this team has been in championship or bust mode, and by the end of the year, it has always ended in bust because of unforeseen setbacks, primarily injuries to either Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, or both of them, but we also can't write off their collapse in the bubble either. They've had tons of shot making and stout defensive players everywhere, but the one missing piece they've struggled to find was a floor general point guard who can provide a level of passing and playmaking that could make the lives of their shot makers easier. Easier. They went from Reggie Jackson, to a washed up version of Rajon Rondo, to Eric Bledsoe, to a washed up version of John Wall, and none of them could give them what they needed in that role. At last year's trade deadline, they acquired Russell Westbrook in another attempt to fill that hole, and I'll be honest, Russ was actually doing really well for them after being scapegoated hard for his time on the Lakers. The Clippers brought Westbrook back in free agency this season because he gave them reason to trust him, and if I myself am being completely honest, I thought Westbrook's bit of re-emergence was going to make the Clippers less likely to pursue this James Harden trade, because at this point in their careers, they give you a lot of the same things, both good and bad. It clearly didn't though, so now we have to look at how all of these pieces fit together. Star talent wins in the NBA more often than not. That's been proven time and time again in this league, with the champions typically being led by groups with multiple stars, and the Clippers have a lot of that kind of talent. James Harden is the reigning assist leader of the league, and for the first time from start to finish in a season, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George have a lead guard that can handle the ball, handling duties, and create for the players around them, as opposed to always having to create for themselves. The Clippers also successfully held on to all of Terrence Mann, Norman Powell, and Bones Highland, who were all players that most assumed would have to be involved in a James Harden trade for it to go through, which is a massive win for them keeping their second unit loaded with scoring talent. All of this is the obvious positive to come from the deal, and with all of those wins, they will almost undoubtedly be in contention in the Western Conference this season, however, it's not all sunshine and rainbows for them after this trade. The Clippers being all in on star talent is great, but they have shown a blatant disregard for how they actually all fit together, and they've also sacrificed a lot on defense to make this happen. If they do end up starting both James Harden and Russell Westbrook in the same starting lineup, then that is a backcourt with, to be blunt, a lot of concerns on the defensive end and even with the amount of turnovers they commit. James Harden has always been better defending bigger players throughout his career 
career and has struggled to keep actual guards in front of him, Russell Westbrook's defensive highs and lows have been prevalent for a long time as well, and then having Kawhi Leonard forced to start at power forward now might not be the best idea with how often he now struggles with injuries. Being moved to power forward with Paul George at the small forward position would have Kawhi guarding bigger and stronger players more often, and while Kawhi has always been an elite perimeter defender, the same cannot be said about his work against bigger guys especially at this point in his career. Then, if the Clippers were to choose to bring either Harden or Westbrook off the bench, the concerns of keeping everyone happy pop up, because these are all players who want to be heavily involved. This is now a team that, without a doubt, has as much talent as anyone in the league, but you cannot underestimate the importance of chemistry on the basketball court, and there are a lot of red flags in that regard to watch out for, so we'll just have to wait and see. Now to flip over to the 76ers side of things, this is a deal that they were basically forced into making with their backs against the wall for months. When the season arrived with Harden still on their roster, there was some belief that the Sixers would hold out for a while, but they chose instead to just get it all over with and move on with their season. With Tyrese Maxey playing so well to start the year, they probably felt more capable of surviving this season without Harden, and all four of the players that they brought back in this deal are on expiring contracts, which helps the Sixers maintain their cap flexibility for next offseason, which is where I want to put the focus. Throughout the entire saga, reports have been saying that the primary focus of the Sixers' front office has been to have as much money to spend as possible next summer to retool around Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey. After this trade, they will have an estimated $66 million to spend in that free agency period, which opens them up to signing a player to a max contract, and then some additional pieces to round out the rotation while factoring in Tyrese Maxey's cap hold with him due for a big contract extension that summer as well. Looking at some players that could be free agents next summer, you see some names that become obvious potential targets, including Pascal Siakam, OG Ananobi, DeMar DeRozan, Klay Thompson, LeBron James, and then funnily enough, both Kawhi Leonard and Paul George too, who have player options after this year and could opt out and become free agents. That aspect is actually something that adds even more pressure to the Clippers to come out on top this year, because if they flame out falling short of expectations expectations again, then both Leonard and George could leave, and if they do, the Sixers will be waiting there to offer them contracts. Returning back to the short term now, I also want to point out that the draft capital the Sixers received from the Clippers in this trade is entirely the reason why this deal went through. The players that got sent over from Los Angeles can be decent enough short-term depth pieces with a nice Robert Covington reunion helping their defense and KJ Martin's explosiveness as a slasher and cutter fitting into their new look offense, but the draft picks are what is most important. Two unprotected first round picks in return for a player who was on an expiring contract that didn't even want to be there in the first place is definitely solid, all things considered. And immediately after the deal went down, more reports started to come out about the Sixers wanting to then use those picks in a future trade offer to potentially add more talent, which brings me to the secret plan that I feel like is being hinted at all this time. With all of the smoke going around right now, I believe the Sixers are waiting patiently to pounce on a Zach Levine trade when the Chicago Bulls inevitably go into sell mode and start their rebuild. The Bulls have a very low ceiling with their current core, as demonstrated by the fact that they barely made the play-in tournament last year. DeMar DeRozan's free agency is looming as well, and if the losses start to pile up early this season, then it would be in their best interest to trade their best players for assets that can help set them up for the future, such as first round picks perhaps. The Sixers want to get themselves back into contention because their clock is ticking in the Joel Embiid era, so the likelihood of the first round picks they just traded for being used as trade bait is incredibly high. They have a glaring hole left behind by James Harden in their backcourt too, and the more shot creation they can get around Joel Embiid, the better. 
Now, after all of that discussion, mainly looking at the positives for the Sixers, there are of course some big time negatives to this trade that need to be pointed out as well. The biggest being, obviously, that there is a ton of risk in this plan. As it currently stands, the Sixers can more than likely remain as one of the better teams in the Eastern Conference and make the playoffs as a top 5 seed again, but they're not realistic title contenders. Setting themselves up for potential future moves is good thing for sure, but but there's also no guaranteeing that a future big move will actually come about. Zach Levine can be a trade target, but if another team outbids them on the trade market, then that's a swing and a miss. They can offer big name free agents big money contracts, but if those players don't actually want to come to the 76ers and choose to sign elsewhere, then having all of that cap space would be for nothing. And then of course, if that becomes the case, then the likelihood of Joel Embiid requesting a trade increases is tenfold because he's going to want to maximize the rest of his prime years. In this trade represented some high risk, high reward scenarios for both the Clippers and the 76ers, and there's a realistic path for either of them to either hit a home run or to crash and burn. And with that being said, that's all I have for you today. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and comment down below what you think about this trade. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.